Let's start recording. So we're very pleased to have Raffaele Daniolo. Uh, he's uh, just taken a position at Sacle in France. Raffaele went through several interesting places like uh, the IAS at Princeton, Slack, uh, and now he's going to tell us about the weak scale as a trigger. And let's hope we stay safe. So <laughs> yeah, take so it away. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's it's a pleasure to be to be uh, with you virtually. Um, yeah. So so the talk uh, is about the hierarchy problem. Is about the size of the Higgs boson mass squared. Um, most of it is uh, actually about um, a more systematic way of thinking about existing solution rather than something entirely new. And then towards the end, I will also tell you about uh, a new idea to explain the value of the Higgs boson mass. Um, most of the talk is based on the paper with Nima that I was asked uh, explicitly to talk about, but the end uh, is uh, also based on a new paper in preparation with Daniele Teresi at CERN. And uh, I'm going to start with a very, very basic and a bit cartoonish introduction to the problem. Uh, which will not be completely precise, but will be good to set the stage and also to give uh, younger people or people that are not familiar with the problem a bit more context. After that, um, I will talk about this standard model and beyond the standard model triggers, which are just operators whose vacuum expectation value depends on the X vacuum expectation value. And after that, I will show you how to use these operators in, uh, in cosmology to explain the value of the X mass that we observe. All right, so uh, let me start with my uh, very, very basic introduction. So, well, I like to use this picture that some of you might have seen a few times. Uh, if you were to walk in the woods and, and you saw this configuration, you would not probably think that it was an, an accident of nature. And what we're facing today in fundamental physics resembles this situation, but it's way more extreme uh, quantitatively. Uh, in particular, uh, if we want to be a bit more precise, we have uh, some observables, which we understand as the sum of multiple contributions that in principle are unrelated from each other. And we can uh, compute at least one of these contributions and we can measure the observables. And we find that uh, the observable that we measure is much, much smaller than the contribution that we can compute. So um, we are led to assume, at least in theory, where in theories where the observable can be computed, that there is some accidental cancellation taking place. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you observe such a situation, you don't really think about an accident, but you immediately think that you might have missed either a symmetry or some landscape of, of value. So this symmetry could explain why uh, two parts of your calculation are approximately the same, modulo a small difference. Uh, a landscape is a bit more uh, um, involved and less clean, but it can also explain why uh, a number comes out to be accidentally much smaller than you were imagining. Maybe this observable is not uh, realized in a unique way in our universe or in the multiverse, maybe there are many different values of these observables in different patches of the universe or even within our universe. And it might be that there are so many of them that an accident can happen with order one probability. But, uh, but uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt at the very beginning, but still um, I'm trying to follow what, what is framework because uh, if we are talking about, say, I don't know, like standard model, right? Uh, yeah. uh, like a renormalizable theory. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, uh, in, uh, in any renormalizable theory, you know for, for sure that you cannot calculate uh, stuff uh, because you have some number of uh, stuff which you need to put as input, right? Yes. Uh, so when you are talking about, say, I don't know, here, there, here, whatever, uh, uh, yeah, then either you have in mind some, not a standard model, but something like a finite theory where everything could be calculable. And then of course we can discuss it. Or, but if you are talking about uh, in terms of framework of a theory, city, I even do not understand the issue, right? Because- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I completely agree. Indeed, I'm, I'm secretly thinking about that the standard model is extended for example, by supersymmetry or by anything else that makes the X mass calculable. 
I, I agree that in the standard model, it's not a problem. I mean, the, yeah. there, there is not another mass scale, but uh, we have um, many hints from, uh, from measurements that there should be other scales beyond the standard model. And so I'm assuming that there is some theory in which this parameter is calculable. Right, but then you should have in mind something like I don't like I you know string theory or whatever where, where it's a finite theory, right? Because no, I mean, let's uh, the, 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 that you can calculate everything. I mean, in terms of I don't know Planck mass or whatever, right? But yes, I mean, yes. So for now, I don't want to specify the the UB theory. Uh -huh. But you, yeah, you can think about string theory. You can think about supersymmetry at some lower scale. Uh, what anything that I'm going to say in the following doesn't need uh, a specific theory. Just, just the fact that the parameter is calculable mm -hmm. and, that, and that this theory lives at a scale higher than, than the standard model. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so, so when I talk about a landscape, you might have in mind the string theory landscape, but one can also think about different realizations for example, in condensed matter, there are landscapes everywhere in some loose sense. So if you were to build uh, some easing model in your laboratory in two dimensions and then scan the temperature, you could call that a landscape. So it's, uh, it's a man-made landscape where you are barring some parameter and populating many different values of uh, the mass of the scalar that uh, uh, describes the low energy oscill oscillations of the model. So in this case, you would not be too surprised to see a scalar that is much lighter than the inverse lattice spacing because you have an angle that you can turn and generate a landscape of value for this mass. And if you're very close to the critical temperature, the mass of this scalar is small. And, uh, and so when I talk about a landscape, I'm not necessarily committing to this string theory construction that some of you are familiar with, but there are also different ideas on the market where this landscape is entirely contained in our universe. Okay, so how does this story apply to fundamental physics? Well, as you, as you probably all know, there are two parameters in the standard model Lagrangian that have a large scale in dimension. And at least in the standard model, they're not protected by any symmetry. One is the cosmological constant and the other one is the Higgs boson mass squared. And uh, in a very loose sense, the cosmological constant determines the maximal size of the observable universe either in, uh, in terms of a decitter horizon or um, in terms of a maximal time that the universe can exist before crunching or an ABS size. And the Higgs mass squared uh, is also important for low energy phenomenology, again, due to its large scale in dimension, because it determines the range of the weak forts, the mass of ups and down quarks. And so it ultimately whether complex nuclei can form or not. And so chemistry and life in some sense. And uh, if very naively we uh, take some theory that lives, say, at the Planck scale, where these two parameters can be calculated, and we use dimensional analysis uh, without doing any, any more than that, we find a contradiction between uh, dimensional analysis and experiment. And of course, this is a very, very naive um, thing to do, but it's, sign it's signaling to us that uh, these two parameters are potentially sensitive to UV contributions. And so we want to try to understand their observed value. But, and, but, but when you uh, uh, take uh, uh, talking about the theory prediction for lambda is this cosmological constant or this one, you are already implying what we discussed, right? That, that because, uh, you know, I mean, in, 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 in which units you're calculating, right? Uh, so you're implying that it's, it's calculable. Yes, I'm implying that it's calculable indeed. And uh, I think that this failure of fundamental analysis is signaling to you that in any theory where it's calculable, something non trivial is happening. No, no, not, not that many theories. You know, uh, you, 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 then you're not specifying which one, right? But so, so in this way, and there are some other scales there besides Planck mass as well. So, so it's not clear, you know, uh, so say, uh, you know, w w w because no, it's clear that it is the most naive uh, approach when you're putting only one parameter like a Planck mass. 
No, no, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I've not proven anything. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm, I've just shown that uh, that whatever. I mean, if there is a theory up there where these two parameters are calculable, yeah. there should be something interesting happening, or if uh, everything is happening in the UV, or maybe this the explanation is simpler and there is a symmetry happening at a lower energy. I mean, in the case of the X mass, the problem is much less. Uh, deep in some sense. I mean, if you literally take string theory at the Planck scale or at the string scale and try to compute the X mass naively, you're going to get something of the order of the string scale. Um, okay, so faced with this, I mean, I would say that the easiest uh, answer that might come to mind is that there is a symmetry that protects these parameters. Maybe it's embedded in this Bay area energy theory, but maybe it, uh, it um, arises at much lower energies. And if you think about asymmetry, you immediately notice that the two parameters that we measure are at very different scales, one with, with respect to the other. The cosmological constant is much smaller than the X mass. And so it comes naturally to try to think about the two problems separately, because if it's indeed asymmetry that is um, explaining their observed value, Presumably, uh, this symmetry will live at a scale comparable to the one that we observe for these two parameters. Uh, and so the two solutions might have nothing to do with each other. So we can maybe even forget about the cosmological constant and focus only on the X boson mass squared. And this is what's been done for many years now. Uh, we've come up with uh, very uh, nice and, and simple theories where the X mass can be calculated and it's small compared to larger scales like the Planck scale. Uh, and we've been looking for, this, for these theories for many years now. Um, if you count from the end of lab, we've been looking for these theories for 40 years, but in reality, we were already looking at lab. So the very most natural way in which supersymmetry could have explained the value of the X mass was if uh, some of its particles already were detectable by lab. And we have not seen any, any trace of, uh, of this kind of physics, which doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, it's still entirely possible that this is the explanation for the X mass, but it's time, I think, to think about also a bit more creative alternative where you can substitute the adjective creative with your favorite one, including crazy if you want, but uh, well, this is what the talk today is going to be about. Uh, in particular, we're, we're going to take more seriously the idea that there might be a landscape of values, both for the cosmological constant and the Higgs boson mass. And indeed, if there is this landscape of values, um, which could be generated also at very high energies, um, it becomes more, more likely that, uh, that the values that we observe today of these two parameters might be uh, related to some event happening early in the history of the universe. So uh, maybe there are many realizations of these two parameters in different patches of the universe. And for some reason, um, we see a smaller value than, than the naive cutoff of the theory because of an event happening early. So for example, I don't know, all patches with uh, an X mass that is very big might be crunching rapidly, just to give you an example. Uh, and if you want to follow this train of thought, then you need uh, essentially two ingredients. So you need this landscape that I've already mentioned where the X mass and or the cosmological constant take many different values, but I'm gonna focus mainly on the X mass. And then you also need a selection mechanism. So you need something that is uh, um, singling out the value that we observe today. In practice, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, things that are triggered by the Higgs boson mass. So I'm going to uh, look for uh, objects in the standard model and beyond the standard model that are sensitive to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So uh, there yeah. a few years ago, there was a paper by Sawas and his group, I don't even remember if you, you were part of that. Mm -hmm. They were trying to create a landscape uh, for cosmological constant, right? And derive the weak scale as a consequence, right? I mean, like it's difficult to derive cosmological constant out of the solution to the Higgs mass, but, but the reverse, because it's a more severe problem, it's probably possible, no? 
Indeed, and in fact, actually, my whole talk uh, is about this kind of idea. So um, the, the paper by Savas, it's one example, but there are now about 10 or 15 that, and they all have slightly different ideas in them, but they all kind of follow this format that I have just described. In the case, indeed, the, most of these ideas do exactly what you said, and it's what Savas was doing. So to some sense leverage the power of the cosmological constant to select the X mass. Yeah, because it's a more severe problem, right? So if you, if you, if you somehow have a, you know, a, a somewhat, uh, maybe it's a cheating, but somewhat a way of, you know, dealing with it using landscape, maybe the weak scale will, will fall out automatically, right? Yeah, exactly. That's precisely my current point of view, that if there is a landscape for the cosmological constant, it's very likely that there is one also for the weak scale, and then you might as well use it to explain the weak scale. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so indeed, if you have these two ingredients, then today you would observe what we are observing. So you would obs observe uh, a weak scale that seems to be smaller than it should be, but uh, without any physics around it to, to explain the value that we see. Um, Sorry, could I ask a question here? So, um, but there's also another issue in the sense that when you do a landscape for the CC, we don't really have any natural solutions to the CC. So that's why you can think that maybe the landscape is a solution there. But for the Higgs mass, we have, we have two good solutions, right? Susie and composite Higgs. So the question is, why didn't nature choose these two natural mechanisms? And why does it have to be connected to the landscape? So do you have an answer to that question or can you have an explanation for it or not? Well, let me, let me say two things. So the, the first answer is what I was saying before that uh, empirically we have not found them yet. So I'm, I'm playing with these uh, ideas that I admit are a bit more out there than these, these mechanisms that you've described. And the second answer is that um, if there is this landscape indeed, then other than the cosmological constant, presumably also other quantities are changing in the landscape. And at that point, even <laughs> if you like supersymmetry or other dynamical solutions to the problem, then you would ask yourself why uh, you see such a small value, for example, for Susie breaking compared to the Planck scale. That is something that supersymmetry on its own is not telling you or similarly other symmetric solutions. So even if you like those ideas, you might still wonder why uh, we see a precisely the weak scale that we see. No, but, no but, but for Susie breaking, you can imagine that there's some dynamical Susie breaking. Again, it's, it's pretty straightforward to explain why the Susie breaking scale is not at the Planck scale, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I agree, it's all natural, but uh, it could But the have question been... is, why did nature give us these natural solutions, but then not make use of them? See, that's the question. I mean, I don't presume to know. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, no, it's okay. Yeah. No, yeah, no I mean, I, I don't want, I, I, as I said before, I mean, I, I like these solutions and I don't think they're dead. No, but I guess what I was getting at it in, in the way you're going to approach the problem is, do you think there's an answer to that or not? Do you think? An answer in the sense why would nature prefer this cosmological idea? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, but I mean, the only answer that that I can see is of some in some sort, in some sense, aesthetical. Because in some sense, your question is also aesthetical. So you can consider a symmetry solution nicer or more natural as long as it is actually nicer or more natural. But if to accommodate it, you need to do a lot of model building, to, for example, to explain flavor and CP violation, etc. I mean, for me, the real obstacle to Suzy and these other ideas is the little hierarchy problem. It's not the big hierarchy problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the end, in practice, you need to do a lot of work to accommodate flavor in Suzy, CP violation in Suzy in the, in oh, the but, way that doesn't mess up observables. Mm -hmm. and, but, but, you, but you see, in, no, how to say, in, um, when we are talking about, say, supersymmetry or something like that, it is a statement that, not, not a statement, it implies that we have some intermediate scale, right? Because then we're introducing some other scale, which is not uh, directly related to plan scale. Okay. Now, when you are talking about this landscape, whatever, uh, 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 the idea is that, as far as I, I, as I can follow, that 
you are not introducing, uh, you know, intermediate scale um, from the very beginning, but essentially you are introducing uh, the scale by 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 the cho by uh, your particular choice, right? Because I mean, <laughs> when you're fixing up something, uh, it's equivalent to introducing certain scale uh, because, you know, you have only mass of Planck and nothing else, right? I mean, originally, and then, then you're saying, okay, let, let's, uh, in, uh, Pick yeah, up. I mean, also in this case, you will have to introduce a scale, but it will be uh, right. So, so you are introducing a scale. It will be a very small scale that is very weakly coupled, and it's kind of the weak. Yeah, scale. yeah right, right. But once you are picking up particular value, you are introducing scale, and then the only part uh, uh, which I can follow in what you are saying is that that once you introduce this intermediate scale, you can explain both phenomena at the same time, right? Uh, that, uh, 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 cosmological constant as well as, as a Higgs mass. I'm because actually being less ambitious than that. I just want to, to say the following. I want to say that uh, next to supersymmetry and other ideas, there is also another way to explain just the Higgs boson mass. And this other way uh, uses a landscape and some early event in the history of the universe. Plus, it also introduces a scale that you will see in the following, but it's a scale that is very different compared to supersymmetry. So in supersymmetry, you are introducing some intermediate scale. In this case, you are introducing some tiny mass, which is a ratio of uh, the weak scale and the cutoff. And simply this class of ideas leads to very different phenomenology. So what I'm what I'm saying is that this is a conceptual possibility. No, no, no I, we I look I, for but, it and we should. Right, but then then, then you are uh, saying that you can explain this, say, ten to minus twelve, uh, right? For example, uh, in 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 your in your scheme, because <laughs> uh, uh, I mean. Uh, no, uh, uh, I, 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 let, let us not call it intermediate scale, right? But but still, you know, predictive power of your consideration would be a relation between, say, CC and um, Higgs mass or something like that, right? Well, in, in my case, the the I mean, what I'm doing effectively is the same as in supersymmetry. So I'm making a hierarchy stable between the Higgs mass and some large scale. Mm -hmm. That's it. So I'm, I'm not going to go so far as to explain the cosmological constant at the same time. OK, OK. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, ideally, that will, that will, that's the goal of this program. But so far, no one has succeeded yet. Um, OK, so going back to, um, to the slides, um, so you've seen these two ingredients. I think you you got it uh, given the long discussion that we already had, but uh, to give you a concrete example that you might have already seen uh, uh, in the literature, um, let's look uh, at the relaxation. So in this case, <coughs> there is a landscape <coughs> in the sense that um, the X boson mass is changing throughout the history of the universe as the scalar rolls down its potential. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, so there is a landscape in the sense that it's a landscape populated in time. So, at different times in the history of the universe, the X mass changes. Uh, and then there is some event which is triggered, which is the appearance of these wiggles, which stops the scalar from rolling and selects the X mass. So, this is the type of ideas that I'm going to talk about uh, in the following. And I will first uh, focus on the selection part. And the reason is twofold. Uh, the first one is that it's a general question that's interesting, even if you don't want to solve the hierarchy problem in these weird ways that I'm proposing. You're just asking what is changing in the standard model and beyond the standard model as we change the x -bab. Uh, and the second reason is that it's also the most interesting part from the point of view of experiment, because um, when you look for this selection mechanism, you're always looking for physics coupled to the X, which should be light because it has to be sensitive to the X bev. Um, and um, once you find it, you can also use it to solve the hierarchy problem in many different ways. So effectively you found some experimental signature, which is, which is general, is in general related to naturalness, independently of the very specific mechanism that you're using to select the X mass. 
Uh, and so let's start with the standard model and see what changes in the standard model as we change the x bad, keeping everything, everything else fixed for, for simplicity. Uh, the first one, well, the first obvious answer is that the spectrum is changing. The masses of electrons, W bosons, et cetera, et cetera, are changing. And indeed, people have already used this fact to advocate for anthropic solutions to the Higgs boson mass uh, problem. Um, however, I don't want to go into anthropics, or at least I, I, I like to talk about it as little as possible. I would rather want to find something that can be used uh, more easily from a model building perspective. Uh, in particular, I'm going to look for operators whose vacuum expectation value depends on the X bed. And if you take most uh, gauge singlet operators in the standard model, you'll find just the hierarchy problem. So you try to compute their vacuum expectation value, but through uh, quantum correction, this is sensitive to high scales. That again, there is always the caveat of calculability that we made at the beginning, but uh, you will find that in general, these operators are not directly sensitive to the X value. Uh, there is, of course, one uh, uh, well-known exception, which is the um, which is GG dual, so the contraction of two gluon field strengths. Uh, if you couple very weakly a scalar to it uh, to to see what kind of potential is generated, I'm sure that I don't need to remind people here that. Uh, um, you can match this, uh, this uh, you can rotate this uh, scalar into the phases of the quark mass matrix, then match it to the chiral Lagrangian at low energy, and you're going to find the result that I've written in the middle and at the bottom of the slide. So in the end, you're, you're going to generate a potential for this scalar, which depends on the x bev both through the masses of the up and down quarks and through the running of uh, um, the pi on decay constant. And indeed, people well have made use extensively of this fact to try to select the X mass. I've given you the example of the relaxion, but uh, actually there are many other ways to select the observed value of the X mass cosmologically using this operator, some of them dating back even to 10 years ago. And so the point here is that once you find uh, uh, an operator with this kind of properties, uh, you also found uh, some physics that is generically related to, to the natu to naturalness. Uh, in particular, in this case, you can say that axion-like phenomenology has a role to play or can have a role to play in the hierarchy problem. And this is not something that you would have expected from the traditional solutions to the problem that we've been talking about uh, uh, before. Um, so why does this work? I mean, the reason is relatively obvious. Um, you can write this operator as the divergence of a current. So if you couple a scalar to it, there is a shift symmetry protecting it. But this, uh, this current is not gauge invariant and, uh, and QCD breaks, it, breaks this shift symmetry non-perturbatively. So you generate the potential uh, you've seen in the previous slide. And so we are looking for operators that uh, are pro whose vacuum expectation value is protected by some symmetry, which is broken predominantly by the X map. So something quite, of, quite obvious that we could have uh, known uh, from the beginning. Um, you can try to think about other uh, possibilities within the standard model. But, but it is not, uh, I'm sorry, but it's not, I mean, it's like uh, axion-like field, right? So uh, standard model in its original sense doesn't contain it, right? I mean, okay, you can you can add, add it up, uh, but but it's not uh, Higgs field uh, per se, you know, in, in the model, right? Yeah, that's true. No, no, yeah, I was only talking about the GG dual operator. Uh, the, the scalar, then you have to add it uh, if you want to select the X. Right, right, but what I'm trying to say is that this scalar is not your H, uh, not, not your Higgs scalar, right? No, 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 but, uh, but, the, but, it's, uh, but, but the bad year is the one of the X. So the, yeah, okay, right, but, but uh, still, still in a, if you're not adding additional... Uh, uh, field in standard model, you, uh, the, this particular uh, phenology does not apply by itself, right? 
you cannot so if you don't add other fields you don't yeah you cannot do anything with this operator in yeah the, right right it was what i yeah, it's, no i mean yeah. so in this way it's already extension of standard model in certain sense sure yeah 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 yes i mean it it, it was just a, a like a useful pedagogical way to build up the yeah. tool but, uh, yeah. <laughs> we agree we agree um all right so yeah you can look for other operators uh, with these properties and um i don't know i so we didn't prove any theorem, but within the standard model, uh, again, just from the operator perspective, we didn't find uh, uh, any good candidate. You can think about, for example, WW dual, which would be essentially have this exact same properties as GG dual. The problem here is that uh, um, there is no other explicit B plus cell breaking within the standard model other than the spirons itself. So whatever you couple to WW dual, you can rotate it away just purely within the standard model. And so you need to add extra physics, which might be even just neutrino masses. So this is indeed an interesting candidate that I think no one has tried to use to solve the, the hierarchy problem. Um, another possibility that is that takes maybe 30 seconds instead of 10 to discard is our operators protected by flavored symmetries, like the one that I've uh, written down below. The problem is that flavored symmetries are already broken within the standard model by dimensionless parameters. So at some loop level, you will always find contribution sensitive to high scales. Uh, and in the case of the operator at the bottom of the slide, it happens at three loops, but it still happens. So if you want to solve, if you want to explain the separation between the X mass and a huge scale, say the Planck scale, you cannot use this operator. If you want to explain the separation between the X mass and say 100 TV, then it's fine. Uh, at least uh, if you don't add extra physics. So. Okay, so now um, we are ready to move on and look for other kinds of operators which require extending further the standard model. Before doing it, uh, let me just uh, remind you why we're doing it. We're doing it because uh, these operators essentially represent new physics related to, to the X boson mass squared that we are not necessarily expecting from the usual symmetry solution. So they can uh, give experimentalists something new to look for that's generically interesting. Okay, so now let's go beyond the standard model again with the caveats that uh, we made before. Um, the first obvious thing that came to our mind is that if you add a second X doublet, uh, then the operator H1, H2 that I've written at the top of the slide is a good candidate. So it, it's protected by some Petschekwin symmetry if you construct the model in a certain way. So its VEV might indeed be protected from high energy contributions. Uh, in particular, we find uh, uh, very simply that if you make the operator odd under some Z2 symmetry, then um, if the Lagrangian of the twigs doublet model respects this Z2, this Z2 symmetry, the web uh, is essentially sensitive only to the, to the mass squares of the two Xs and is not sensitive to very high scales, so what we would like to have. Uh, let me stress that, uh, so we talked about this operator uh, at length in the paper with Dima, but we didn't invent anything new. I mean, people already knew that this operator was a good candidate in this sense. Uh, what we did was, uh, well, on the one hand, set to a more systematical ground this idea of triggers. And the second thing that we did was to show that uh, this uh, operator can still work phenomenologically, which was not obvious at all. Uh, and let me show you why. So let's say you impose this Z2 symmetry on your Lagrangian. Then what happens is that you end up with a potential for the two Xs that has the two masses, but and then only quartic couplings. There is no uh, other dimension full scale other than the mass in the potential, because this V mu term is set to zero by the Z2 symmetry. And also these other two quartics here at the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> well, the reason why you have to set to zero these, these uh, terms, it's kind of obvious from the symmetry perspective because these are spurions that are odd under the Z2. So in principle, they can contribute to the web of this operator or give you contributions that are sensitive to the cutoff. 
if you don't have any spur that is odd under the symmetry, then uh, you can never generate a, a, a contribution to this bed that is sensitive to some high scale. Uh, if you want to see it more graphically, you can, again, imagine that you are coupling some scalar to this operator and then integrate out the standard model. And then if you have these odd terms, you can always close this kind of loops and find contributions that uh, uh, are not directly sensitive to the X masses as we would like them to be. Um, so before uh, completing, uh, so to complete the model, we also have to decide how this X is coupled to the standard model fermions. And in particular, uh, we have chosen the charge assignment under the Z2 that it's safest phenomenologically because already this assignment is very hard uh, to, to not detect at the LHC. Uh, in practice, uh, we end up with the Yukawas down here. So only one X is coupling to all the fermions and the other one um, is not. And why, why I keep saying that uh, it's not so obvious that this model is alive? Well, the reason uh, is quite simple, and sorry, and it's that in the potential, there is no other mass scale under than the weak scale. So in the end, you're looking for states that are electroweak coupled to the standard model and have masses of order of a few hundred GV or less. So uh, what are the constraints on the uh, uh, web of the inert Higgs? Yeah, I'll show them to you in a couple of slides. Uh, just before that, uh, uh, let me only say that now that we have completed the model, we can compute the web of this operator. And indeed, uh, okay, as we expect, it's just a function of the two masses. It's zero if, um, if um, these masses are positive and it can be non-zero if the masses uh, are negative. So sorry, if the mass squares are negative. Um, here I'm showing you what's the situation for temperature higher than the QCD scale, for temperatures lower than the QCD scale, you can develop a web also if uh, the mass of the X doublet that couples to the, to the quarks and leptons is positive because this uh, X doublet gets a tadpole from uh, the condensation of quarks and then you get a web from that tadpole. So this is the situation as advertised with this symmetry, the web is uh, insensitive to uh, the UV and it's a, a function of the X masses and lambda QCD. And now, uh, yeah, let me answer uh, Maxim's question. So, so as I was saying um, before, um, there are no scales in the potential except for the weak scale, except for the two masses. So, so in our universe, um, the, the the scalars contained in the new X doublet are light. Uh, in particular, the pseudo scalar and the charge DX are a few hundred GV because if you take this cortex larger than two at the weak scale, you get a Landau pole right on top of your head at around that EV already. Uh, and interestingly, the CPU in X is actually lighter than the standard model X because uh, as you make the web, so you need the web of the inner doublet to be smaller than the web of our X. Huh? as the question was, uh, was suggesting. The reason is that we know that most of the mass of the W and Z come from the X that we've already observed at the LHC. And there are also a bunch of other indirect constraints. And when you make the web uh, of um, the inner doublet small, also the mass of the CP even uh, member of the doublet becomes small in this model where there is no B mu term. And so just by looking at this slide, you would imagine that this is already excluded by a combination of indirect searches and, and the LHC. Uh, I'm gonna show you only one slide to give you a feeling of the phenomenology, but if this doesn't fully answer your question, I, I can show you more slices of parameter space. Uh, in particular, so here I'm showing you the mass of the charge digs on the X axis of each one of the three figures, oh, sorry and the mass of the CP even X on the Y axis of each one of the figures. And going from left to right, the web of the inner doublet is increased from 0.2 to 0.5 of the weak scale. And the mass of the CP odd uh, uh, X is fixed everywhere. 
And okay, you can already see from this slide that the answer to the previous question is that the, the value of the inner doublet is about, cannot be larger than 0.4, the weak scale roughly. So 0.5 already uh, a bunch of flavor and electroweak precision observable constraints kill you, plus direct searches at lab, direct searches at the LHC, et cetera, et cetera. But it can also not be that small because if you go in the opposite regime, then uh, the X, the CP and X is becoming lighter and lighter, right? So because of this. Huh? And so to avoid direct searches and uh, indirect searches, you have to make the portic bigger, but if you make the portic bigger, you're getting a Landau pole very soon. So in practice, there is a, actually a range for this web. It's not also only an upper bound, and it's roughly between 0.4 uh, and 0.1. Uh, and you can see from, well, okay, uh, typically I don't go that much in detail. I did it just to answer the question, but the, just the, the take home message from this slide is that there is a region that is still alive in, that I'm showing you in white, but it's not a huge region. So you can have this ch charge dx between roughly 100 GV and uh, 200 GV and the CP even between, uh, I don't know, 80 GV or 70 GV and uh, 110 roughly. <clears throat> and so if you look at projections, you'll see that uh, it's almost guaranteed that high luminosity would either see or not see this kind of model. I mean, either, either see it or exclude it. Okay, so uh, all this story was just, uh, was just uh, to show you that it's not so easy to find uh, these operators because they require new physics that is coupled to the X, essentially at order one, and that is lighter than the weak scale. Otherwise, uh, <clears throat> it's going to contribute to the value of the operator more than the X band. And uh, in practice, so the only examples of this kind of operators that I know are GG dual, this H1, H2, uh, and uh, uh, they all have quite distinctive phenomenology that you might not have expected from, from uh, usual symmetry solutions to the hierarchy problem. So it's interesting new physics that experiments can look for. In particular, this uh, Twix doublet model, as you've seen, it's very peculiar. I mean, it's not something that was unknown in the literature, but it's quite different from what you would usually look for, for example, in supersymmetry. It's, this is cer certainly not similar to a type two to HDM with a B mu term. Um, and so all this story leads uh, to ask more questions. So whether there are other triggers within the standard model, whether there are other simple beyond the standard model triggers. And as I showed you, it's not so easy to find them, but especially beyond the standard model, it's certainly possible. Uh, but more importantly, so I've uh, gone through all this, uh, uh, this pain, but I haven't yet even started or tried to solve the hierarchy problem, but let's, let's try to do it. Um, and well, as I said before, the, the take home message from this part of the talk is that there are operators that are sensitive to the X web. There are not so many, and if you go beyond the standard model, it's not so easy to survive uh, constraints. Um, there are the two that I've talked about, or you can also construct GG dual for BSN gauge group and add vector like fermions that get part of their mass from the X. But even in that case, the vector like mass cannot be much larger than the weak scale, otherwise, you're not sensitive to it. And so it's all kind of around the corner. So it's all pretty specific phenomenology that you can target in the next few years experimentally. Uh, so, okay, so now we, I've given you my spiel about uh, why uh, these trigger operators are interesting, but now let's, let's put them to work and, uh, and see how uh, one might select the value that we observe for the, for the weak scale. Uh, and I'm gonna show you one example that at the moment is my favorite, maybe because I'm working on it now, uh, which I find particularly simple. So I'm going to add to the standard model two new scalars that are very light and weakly coupled. Um, and uh, in the minimal version, this is all I need. So we're going to couple this, we, you can couple these scalars to GG dual. Uh, or you can add also these extra X and couple them to H1, H2. Uh, interestingly, this idea um, 
is not really doing anything to inflation or whatever, ex I mean, is doing the job of inflation. It's even uh, in some sense compatible with one plan conjectures, although my whole philosophy is completely orthogonal as you've seen in the talk. And uh, it also doesn't require huge super Planckian excursions as the relaxation used to do at the very beginning. So it's, it's truly uh, a simple model, which is not trying to hide the complex model building anywhere else. <clears throat> uh, and the basic idea is very simple. So you start with this landscape of X mass squares, which can have uh, any value between some large scale M star squared and minus M star squared. And some of these patches are going to have the value that you observe for the X map. Um, after uh, reheating and after the electroweak phase transition, all patches that have uh, the X web outside of a certain value crunch. And so everything that uh, survives until today undergoes uh, um, uh, a long phase of expansion and, uh, and uh, lives for a very long cosmological time as the X web. So essentially the only way to have a universe that even remotely resembles our own is to have uh, a small X web. And how do you do that? Well, the, the, the way to do it is relatively simple. So uh, let's look uh, at scalar number one that I'm gonna call phi minus. And let's look at the potential of phi minus in the absence of uh, a coupling with the X. So I'm setting this second piece to zero in the cartoon down here. And I'm going to imagine that the potential of this scalar phi minus as a, a minimum that is safe in the sense that its energy density is much, much smaller this, than this M star to the fourth. And then a minimum that is very deep and the energy density in this minimum is much larger than the largest cosmological, con it's not much larger, but it's order one larger than the, mass than, the than the largest cosmological constant in the landscape. So essentially, if you end up in this minimum, the universe crunches. If you are here instead, you can live for a long time. Uh, now you've seen but that- ec Excuse me, by introducing this uh, almost double well potential, you already define a high hierarchy, right? Because the vacuum yeah. energy density on the left minimum is radically different from the vacuum energy density in the right minimum. Then you will have to explain how the nature figured it out. That's what it is, it's hundred orders of magnitude or so, right? Indeed, but uh, uh, essentially I'm moving this hierarchy problem to this scalar, which is very, very weakly coupled to us. And so it can also be very weakly coupled to everything else. And, uh, and this, this hierarchy can be stabilized by either supersymmetry or, or scale invariance at a very high scale. So this scalar is approximately ship symmetric and is very weakly coupled to everything. And this hierarchy is stabilized by a symmetry at the high scale that this scalar knows about. So this is the, the idea. So, so essentially I'm, uh, I'm reusing the usual symmetries, but I'm using them on this scalar, which is but very weakly coupled to us. Uh, uh, Fairly, but I believe what Misha is saying is that in this way, okay, uh, it, is, uh, it is still, you can say that it is hierarchy uh, you are introducing here is these terms, right? Because it is essentially it's the same hierarchy, but they are formulated in a different terms. It's true, right. but this hierarchy now it's uh, made stable by a symmetry that yeah, I don't. Yeah. Right, right, right. But it's so, so, but it is a kind of different way to put this hierarchy. You know, uh, when you are doing this way, right? Uh, no, no, but, uh, wait, wait. Yeah, sure. Th this uh, field phi. Uh, v of phi, which has two minima, so uh, drastically different in, in the depth of this minima, it has radiative corrections too, right? Mm -hmm. And unless yeah. they're prevented, the presence of this yeah. blue minimum will eventually impact the yellow minimum and they'll, will destroy this high hierarchy, right? No, no, that's, that's, uh, so what I'm saying is that this hierarchy between the two minima can be made stable, for example, by, 
scale invariance. So for instance, this phi can be a, an approximate dilaton or an approximate modulus. Well, but, then, uh, OK. Then this scale, is, this scale, is, yeah. yeah. But and, if, if it is, you see, if this field can fall down, first of all, you have to make sure that the barrier is very high, right? Because uh, the phase space for this vacuum to start for heavy vacuum to start impacting the light vacuum is very is very large, right? Because all parameters in the blue vacuum are huge, and all parameters in the yellow vacuum are small. So, when uh, the quant quantum fluctuations are not, it's not two different fields, right? This one and this is another. This one field. And it quantum fluctuates in the in quantum mechanics, right? So it does feel somehow that somewhere there is a very, very deep minimum. Now, usually it's quantum corrections, either perturbatively or non-perturbatively, it will feel it, right? You cannot just switch it off. So you have to prove that this intermixing between, between uh, these two minima keep the vac the mass or the, the yeah the mass of the particle in the yellow minimum the mass and the couplings especially very very small yes yes but so it's not this uh, is a, essentially that's the same mechanism right to protect light sector from heavy sector, except you are invoking another particle in this consideration. No, exactly. I mean, so, so the, the, yes, this, the, the, the hierarchy between these two minima can be made stable in the usual way, exactly as you would do for the X in the, in the, in the traditional Standard. To the problem. Yeah, right? forget, forget about this phi field. No, no, but you agree that, uh, that it's tech, I mean, there is a natural way to stabilize this hierarchy, right? Not here. If you have a natural mechanism to stabilize this hierarchy for the in, uh, imagined uh, phi field, what prevents you from using this very same mechanism for one yeah. of the Higgs's, yeah, which are... You. Yes. which are in standard model or in MSSM. Nothing. Yeah, what, what prevents me is that uh, the scalar, this new scalar is extremely weakly coupled to us. And so if this mechanism stabilizes this hierarchy, I will not see it experimentally. Instead, if this mechanism stabilizes the X mass hierarchy, I'm supposed to see it uh, uh, already. I actually was supposed to see it already at lab in principle. So, yeah, but, the, okay. but it, so it reminds you uh, really experiment about axion, for example, right? So it look like axion like, right? Uh, example you, you gave before. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, this can be also axion like. I'll show you that this, this part in this slide, it's not axion like, but you can make it axion like. Yes. Yeah, yeah I see. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Well, I see that. Uh, that uh, you don't like, well, I mean, I see that there is some, some resistance to, to the general idea, but said in the most modest way that I can put it, we have been looking for the simplest possible solutions, but we haven't found them. So these, I agree that are a step further in complication and uh, in model building, but they have completely different experimental consequences and they are consistent and not that complicated. So I think that we should be looking for them as well. Um, so having said this, uh, well, let me complete the picture, although I think that you uh, already have an idea of what's going to happen. So as you see, I've coupled the scalar to H1, H2. And so when uh, H1, H2 gets a large web, the stat pole generated for phi destroys the safe minimum. And so all universes with a large H1, H2 web rapidly crunch. Um, if we want to select the, if we want also to get rid of universes where the X mass squared is large and positive and the web is zero, we can just construct a similar potential. But in this case, um, the potential without the X only has the deep minimum. 
And if you turn on the start pole, a second minimum is generated. It's just a matter of signs of the odd terms. And so this second scalar is instead uh, uh, keeping you safe only if the x bad is large enough. And so in practice, these two scalars are keeping you in a range. Um, you can do the same also coupling uh, um, the scalars to GG dual and have axon-like phenomenology as was uh, just suggested. Uh, the only thing you need is some uh, residual theta angle at low energy so that uh, you have a tadpole. At least this is the easiest way to do it. Uh, and if you, if you do it using GG dual, the model has some qualities that I like, which are that uh, it's very simple to write down. So you can write just the most general polynomial potential for, for the scalars. I set to one or the one coefficients, but it doesn't really matter that much for us. Um, the only thing, so what's stabilizing this hierarchy as we were talking about before is a small mass for the scalar, which is natural because of an approximate shift symmetry. And then uh, you are coupling these two scalars also to, to the gluons. So you can write this whole model in, in one line, if your line is long enough, in two, <laughs> like in this line. Um, except for these two axon-like scalars, uh, there is no new physics below the cutoff that can be quite large, all the way to one intermediate scale. And in principle, you can envision seeing these two scalars uh, with Casper. Um, the last, well, another quality is that unlike the relaxation or other ideas uh, in this ballpark, we're not doing anything to inflation. So all this story happens after, uh, after eating. And so it's even compatible to things that are different from inflation. Uh, and finally, we don't really need to use anthropic arguments for the X. Um, okay, so I don't know how am I doing with time? Probably I'm way, well, I'm actually, yes, at the end of the talk. Um, so if you want, I can skip this uh, very last part, which is not uh, especially illuminating. It's just uh, saying why in all these cosmological ideas to solve the hierarchy problem, we find light scalars, but it's kind of obvious. And I think you've uh, uh, guessed it already. Essentially, you have to put the hierarchy somewhere, and you're putting the hierarchy in the small mass of the scalars. If you want no, to be no, but yeah. you can take five minutes just to go through that. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then uh... Uh, may, may I first ask a question because I don't understand everything in this part. Okay, let's assume that in nature there are these light phi plus minus fields. Mm -hmm. And indeed, they have two vacua, one, one uh, not so deep, another is incredibly deep. And somehow this high hierarchy, it's almost an invisible sector because they are very, very weakly coupled. And mm -hmm. therefore, the high hierarchy is maintained, okay? Yes. So, but you couple this field, okay? And then you say that we are in the right vacuum unless if we are in the deep vacuum, then the universe crashes because everything is bad in this. The vacuum expectation value mm -hmm. is so. However, whatever you do, how does this field solve the problem that if with the standard Higgs, you start calculate perturbative corrections to the mass of the standard here field. Yeah. And you formally, there is a correction which is quadratically divergent. And if you say, okay, with the standard Higgs, nothing happened. Naively, you would say it drags us towards the Planck scale anyway, right? Yes. What yeah. do you do with this? Yes, so what's explaining this is this, the first part of the story, which is that we are starting from the beginning with a landscape of X mass value. Yeah. And some of them are accidentally tuned. So it's like the cosmological constant in the usual anthropic solution. So these quadratic corrections are indeed there, but uh, in some vacua of, of the multiverse, they accidentally cancel. To okay, other. okay. Still, so still there is the very same uncertainty, right? So the only thing which you added that if this tuning is not well enough, in addition, 
in this theory, this theory will collapse, right? Exactly. So but, every universe yeah, that is not yeah. tuned disappears. I yeah. see. I see. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this is the basic idea. I mean, I I think that I'm not really arguing with your aesthetic point. I mean, I also prefer simpler. Simple no, no, it's it's okay. It's a, a sort of uh, I mean explanation for the anthropic principle because you say that there is an unknown mechanism of tuning the Higgs mass and it can take microscopically it could take any value but then you add the atropic principle and say that it if it's tuning is not too efficient this Higgs mass takes a large way and we don't know anything about this fine tuning mechanism not a single thing but you say okay the, the, tuning, if, mechanism, the tuning mechanism to, to be fair, you can even write down a simple explicit model with many vacua where the X mass is changes from vacuum to vacuum. And if you have enough vacuum, it's tuned. That's, that's, that can be done. So if you no, want but, to also a model of that, which is not complicated. Okay, even if it is accidental fine tuning, you see, you have to show that some positive contributions are cancel by some negative contributions to the Higgs mass, right? So, but you don't address this question. You say, okay, there are many possibilities. This mechanism may or may not work, or maybe God created the constants in such a way that uh, the coupling constant, the Higgs mass is small. But now you want to add the anthropic principle. And you say but, that but, if, if this damn possibilities bad fine tuning you saw the the uh, intelligent designer or whoever made a little bit of a mistake and this fine tuning mechanism whatever it is this universe it's exists for a very short time and then it collapses okay so just in our favor the intelligent designer designer did this fine tuning extremely precise Right. Yeah, so, so this is correct, uh, with, with, but I would want to make two comments on top of yeah. what you said. The first one is that uh, this tuning part is not so mysterious and complicated uh, as you're saying. So you just need essentially to couple some scalars to the X, say phi H squared, and have many of these scalars with different verbs. And then if you have enough uh, minima, which it's easy to do. So if you have say, I don't know, 100 scalars each with two minima, you're going to have two to the 100 total minima. Then that's it. I mean, then automatically you will have different values of the X mass in this different minima. The verbs of the scalar say are all of the order of this large scale. And if you have two to the 100 different possibilities, with different signs, which again, it's easy to, to, to get. Just which, wait, 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 how it is easy to get different signs? If it is due to scalar particles, or no, but you're counting, I'm talking or... about three level, three level. So you have phi h squared. Okay, three level then... is not, three level is not an issue because a three level- No, no, just... no, no, but I'm saying I that just... three level, the three level part is as big as the loop part. Because the value of the scalars is M Planck, let's say, okay? So the X mass has a contribution of order M Planck squared from the value of all the scalars at three level, yeah. plus it has all the loop contributions that are again of the order of M Planck squared, okay? If you have two to the 100 minima, so, so let's say you have 100 scalars and then two to the 100 minima, the three level contributions change from minimum to minimum and they're of the okay. same order. Okay, this I understand. If yeah. you set the Higgs mass uh, very, very large at the very beginning and on, on the wrong side, the quantum correction can be precisely with an yeah. opposite side and but, but, corrected. Okay, but, but this, but is, this, much, this is the same what I am saying. I am saying that for our favor, somebody made it possible. You see, because for instance, assume that at 
very high scale, all these bare Higgs couplings are of the same sign and of the same sign that the that the quantum corrections give. Then no, no matter what you do. Sure, 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 sure. Yes, 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 that's possible. But but it's not that I mean. But but the possibility that I'm advocating doesn't require anything unlikely or very very specific. I mean, I'm just saying but, take 50, 100 scalars, 30 scalars, give them coupling to the x with random signs. And that's it. Then uh, you move from minimum to minimum, and in one minimum at least, the mass of the X will be very, very small. Uh, Rafael, uh, uh, Rafael, might be, uh, I'm not sure that I understand it correctly, but um, my impression is that what you are saying is that uh, you're not solving this original hierarchy, you, you know, for Higgs mass, but you are saying that it could be another hierarchy associated with this. Uh, uh, because when you're introducing this additional field or whatever, then you are saying that, let's say that the entropic principle this, uh, solves this first hierarchy, right? But then you are saying that there is another one and it is another one which you are discussing or, or I'm getting it wrong. Not, not exactly. So, so I'm saying that, uh, so they, in, in this picture, the X mass uh, behaves like a, the, the cosmological constant in the usual entropic picture. So it's yeah. changing from vacuum to vacuum in the landscape. And as I was saying, this is easy to do, right? I mean, it's exactly like the cosmological constant. The webs of some scalars give it a contribution at three level, which is comparable to the loop level contributions. And if you have enough of these different contributions with say half uh, with a sign and half with the other sign, you will find a vacuum where these are very small, right? Right. So this is step one of this idea. And then in step two, you add these uh, new scalars that make all the vacua where the Higgs mass doesn't happen to be accidentally small to crunch. Uh -huh. So if you want the second hierarchy is the one between the minimum of these scalars, but this one is stabilized by asymmetry because these scalars are super weakly coupled. So you don't see this okay. symmetry. So, so, so then you're saying a, a, a sense only, only the correct vacuum would survive. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But why can't you just have a, but but why wouldn't just the first step be a solution, right? You're just you're just having an anthropic solution to the hierarchy problem. Why do you need to add in this uh, second step then? Well, you don't necessarily. Yeah, at that at that point, uh, it becomes a question of uh, of. Um, how much you like, and the, I mean, how much you think that the anthropic arguments for the X uh, are robust versus uh -huh. uh, what, yeah. uh, what I'm proposing. Yeah, I mean, indeed you can solve it anthropically at that point. Yeah. But to be honest, well, so first of all, I think that minimally this is as good as solving it anthropically, but it, it has some observable consequences that you can test, so. Uh -huh. My, my zero order answer is that you can just go ahead, find these scalars and see whether I'm right or whether the people that like anthropics are right. Mm -hmm. um, my less than zero order quest answer is, uh, well, that I've never particularly loved uh, um, these anthropic arguments because they're a bit too detailed for my taste. I mean, uh, yeah. But okay, you, you can say that, that you start from uh, landscape, and then when you found the proper uh, minimum, you are saying let let's uh, demolish everything else, right? And, yeah. and uh, <laughs> well, that get, get rid of landscape effectively, right? Yeah, but see, but that's my yeah. point. Is that why do you, why do you have to demolish everything else? You see, you can just <laughs> everything <laughs> else. Everything else is not causally connected. Exactly. To our universe. Right. Anyway, why do bother? Exactly. Of, of, I mean, of this you, can, uh, you can, yeah, it's true. You can say that uh, you don't want to enter in the any any debate or measure, and that it's enough for you that one universe exists with the small x yeah. mass, and we're there. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I cannot argue with that. I mean, I'm just saying that uh, what I'm describing it's another logical possibility, which is not much more complicated, and we can just see if it's true or not. Uh, experimentally. Anyway, so I think that this long discussion means that I can probably skip these slides, which are much less interesting than discussion. <laughs> and let me just say one thing, which is that 
uh, well, you generically expect these light scale arts if you want to do something similar that, to what I did, also in very different ways, the Laxon or other stories, just because you need the potential of these scale arts on its own to be comparable to the potential given by the Higgs when the Higgs bev is the weak scale. And the only way in which you can do it is if the mass of the scale arts is of the order weak scale over the cutoff to some power. Here I showed you the example with H1, H2, uh, but you can get, use the same parametric argument with any other potential. Uh, and you're going to get a different, different powers of the XVEV and the cutoff, but the expectation that the mass of the scalars is inversely proportional to the cutoff remains. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea why this class, this whole class of ideas, which as I was saying now, it contains a few of them that appear all unrelated, always predicts this, these light scalars. And as I was saying, the power of the level on the cutoff is not really fixed, but uh, this type kind of CISO thing is. Uh, and so, yeah, sorry, I went to, through these slides quickly, but I don't want to keep you too much. Uh, before concluding, I want to say just one more thing, which, which is that uh, if you couple the scale arts to the standard model with the intention of selecting the weak scale, then uh, necessarily either at the electroweak phase transition or at the QCD phase transition, they will receive uh, uh, a displacement from their minimum because the potential, the part of the potential coming from the coupling of the standard model is turning on. And it has to be comparable to the other part of the potential if you want to select the weak scale. And so essentially they're getting their biggest misalignment possible uh, at some fixed temperature. And so uh, they have some energy density, which is fixed by their mass and their coupling to the standard model. And so you can just plot where you get dark matter and you get this sort of universal target. So uh, you can have many different ways of solving the hierarchy problem, not only the crunching one that I described, uh, but in all of them, you end up right drawing one line for where you can have dark matter for this reason. There, of course, this argument is parametric, so there are order one factors. Uh, but uh, here I'm showing you a prediction for the H1, H2 trigger. And uh, well, you can see that, I mean, I find it interesting because it's kind of similar to the WIMP miracle. So you have some dark matter candidate whose relic abundance is not sensitive to the ultraviolet, but it's only determined by its mass and its coupling to the standard model. And here I'm showing you the scalar case. So when the scalars are coupled to H1, H2, but there is a similar line for um, the coupling to GG dual, which essentially coincides with the QCD line for a certain range of masses. Uh, okay, so to wrap up, uh, I showed you some operators that are sensitive, whose vacuum expectation value is sensitive to the x -band. And well, I hope that I convinced you that this means that uh, they represent some generic new physics that might be related to the hierarchy problem. So it's interesting to look for it experimentally. And if you want to use this operator to select the value that we see of the X mass cosmologically, you also predict these light scalars that can either look approximately like axions or uh, like uh, long range fifth forces that are very weakly coupled to us. Uh, and so, okay, to wrap up, uh, I showed you a way to think about cosmological solutions to the hierarchy problem in terms of this weak scale triggers operator. I showed you one trigger operator uh, in the 2HDM, which predicts very characteristic phenomenology that we're gonna see or not see at the LHC. Uh, and finally, um, I showed you also one possible way to use these trigger operators to select the value of the X mass. And interestingly, as a bonus, it came out that we also have some ultralight dark matter target for experiments. And uh, well, um, I think that this kind of class of ideas is, is a bit uh, new in the sense that it's much less mature than supersymmetry and other solutions to the hierarchy problem. So I, I, I think that all the objections you made were, were uh, perfectly reasonable, but you also have to consider these ideas in perspective. So these are the first models that we're building. 
And the long-term goal, of course, is to do more than we're doing now, to maybe even explain the cosmological constant using anthropics as little as possible, maybe find a related solution between the cosmological constant and the Higgs boson mass. So I would say that these are first steps uh, in, in a new direction. And uh, if uh, I'll see you again in five or 10 or 15 years, maybe um, the status of the field will be completely different. Um, However, I mean, I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that progress is being made. So if you compare the models in this ballpark that are being proposed now with the models that were proposed five years ago, I, I see a big difference in terms of uh, how complicated they are versus uh, how much they can explain. All right, so well, thank you very much for listening and for the invitation. All right, thank you, Raffaele. Maybe we will virtually applaud you here. Um, are there any more questions? I, I almost like to comment that really you should be careful about uh, mass shooting. About what? Oh, about mass. <laughs> yeah. And you should also be careful when you said that if you see us in five years' time, I hope it's still not on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So I have a very naive question. Your dark matter miracle, I don't quite get why it's a miracle. Um, so it's not pointing to any scale in particular, right? No, but uh, also the wind miracle is not really, I mean, the wind miracle is better in the sense that you already have the weak scale in the standard model. But if you look at it just from the purely dark matter perspective, it's also just fixing a ratio between coupling and mass. So if you have a force that is much lighter than the Z, you still get the right dark matter for a bigger coupling. So you, you can draw this line also for a wind. And the scalar, I guess, will couple universally 12 standard model fermions if it couples H1, H2. Sorry, the scalar will couple. Uh, will universally? Most, yeah, will essentially mix with the X. And then uh, its most important couplings at low energy where you can actually see it will be to, to nucleons. So uh, through the mixing with the X, it will couple to both the Yukawas and the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And uh, yeah, you would see it uh, from there. So it, it looks like a fifth force that violates the equivalence principle because it's coupling like a, a, a very light things. So I have a I have a technical question which may be irrelevant just just in terms of this crunch. So that means that's a that's a negative cosmological constant. It's anti de Sitter minimum, right? Yes. That's what you have to arrange it to be. And then how does that then? Uh, have you thought about how that relates to whether this theory is in the swamp or not? Because uh, ADS minima with scalar is a uh, problematic, right? If you believe these papers of of Ibanez. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you asked. I mean, so to be honest, I thought more about the De Sitter conjecture than the anti De Sitter conjecture. So, well, uh, so, so I don't have a, a super precise answer to your question. Um, I mean, I can tell you that the field excursions are all subplantian and uh, we are totally fine with the, with the Waffa conjectures. Uh, so the ones on the gradient of the potential, et cetera, et cetera. And also the ones on the tower of states that comes down when you, when you have large field excursions. Uh, the anti de Sitter ones, I have to confess that I have not looked at them uh, with equal uh, attention. But from, from what I understand, uh, uh, they claim that uh, anti de Sitter universes are very short-lived. So they go in the direction of doing what I want to do. So essentially at some point, if their conjecture is right, I think the universe is going to die even faster than, than in my case. But maybe I, I, I misinterpreted them. I'm not really sure. But the reason why I haven't looked at them in great detail is that I'm a bit skeptical of the whole conjecture program in the sense that these are kind of conjectures cube because string theory is a conjecture. We don't, we haven't seen it yet. The examples that are under control within string theory presumably are a small subset because we can do only things super symmetrically and perturbatively. And these conjectures are 
extrapolations of these examples. So they take all the examples we know and they kind of take a step further. So, yeah. This yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> fair enough. But then there was also this model of Chaba Chaki where he was also crunching away the cos cosmological constant problem, but but yes. that's related to what, it's, it seems similar to what you were doing too, right? But you're doing it for the Higgs sector. Yeah, indeed, the, the idea is basically the same. And actually, we first wrote a paper with Chaba. So we, first, we Chaba, Michael Geller, and me. And the oh, system. sorry. Yeah, that's right. You were on that paper. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was right? not on the CC paper, but we wrote ah. another paper for the X. Huh? Ah, OK. Uh, so. The only difference is that um, in the case of the paper with Chaba and also in the case of the CC for Chaba, they are using, uh, so we were using the dilaton of an extra dimension. And so the cutoff of the theory was at a TV because the, the two minima essentially were separated by scale invariance that was coupled to the standard model at order one. Here instead, uh, I'm coupling the scale, and so and we were coupling this dilaton to h squared. And that's why we needed scale invariance at a TV because otherwise h squared would not have been sensitive to the x band. So the only difference technically is that here we're coupling this, we are, the scalars are not the dilaton, they can be a modulus and they're not coupled to H square, but they're coupled to GG dual. And so in practice, the phenomenology is completely different. With, with Chaba, we had to do a lot of work to make this thing, uh, to make this thing phenomenologically acceptable. Here, you don't make any effort. You couple the scalars very weakly and that's it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, so I have a question about the last part. We will talk about this um, miracle alike uh, triggered the uh, miracle. So you mentioned that there's also pseudo scalar example using the GG dual operator. So first of all, this pseudo scalar is not the QCD axiom. It's a, it just has to be another scalar sector yeah. giving those vacuums. And you said that if I try to draw the relic line, it will coincide with which line? I, I, I missed that part. I... Yeah, so this is a part that we're still working out in detail. So the best case is that it sits on top of the QCD line, but I think that it can also live below. So this is something we're calculating now. So this will be a, yeah. Yeah, but, but can you, can you give me a... Um... I'm not yeah. giving you a target that is better than the QCD action. The, the only difference is that uh, um, you, can, you can have dark matter also for misalignments that in the case of the QCD action would look tuned because uh, for this kind of scale arts, the misalignment is of order uh, the cut of, of the X sector, let's say, but the decay constant to which they couple to the action can be much bigger. They can they can couple to G dual can be much bigger. So, in principle, an order one misalignment for them it's like a tiny misalignment for the axon. So so you can get the right amount of dark matter also for much lighter scalars compared to the normal axon. I see. Okay, good. Thanks. So the scalar in principle it doesn't really have any lower bound on the couplings to the center model, right? As far as I know, you mean again from this one plan, the type of conjectures? Well, as I mean, just I know, in general, for your crunch scenario to work. Ah, for my crunch scenario to work, um, any lower bound? Well, um, let me see. Not, not really, because uh, you, I mean, what you care about is the ratio between the potential with the X and the potential without the X. So if you make the potential without the X very small, you can make the coupling smaller. Uh, in practice, the constraint that we eat first is that when the coupling is too small, uh, you the scalar become fuzzy dark matter. So if you want them to be dark matter, they cannot be lighter than some mm -hmm. than 10 to the minus 22 EV. But well, but that depends also on the trigger. There are other constraints that are more detailed. So for, for the GG dual one, as I said, we're still working them out. That's why I didn't really show any plots. So stay tuned for the paper. <laughs> Have more questions? 
Well, if not, then we can thank Raffaele again. So thank you for giving the talk here. Unfortunately, you cannot go for lunch or anything like that. But... Uh, it's a pity, but well, I, I, it was a lot of fun for me. So thanks for the invitation. I guess it's dinner time for you as well. So. Yeah, 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 I have to go or my girlfriend, is just gonna bite my arm. As she, yeah. <laughs> just quickly though, uh, just the picture behind you, right? That's the painted hills, where is that? 